Hello. Hello. Two minutes po, bago tayo magsimula. Two minutes. sa bawat isa. Welcome to Verity Path Baptist Church Pampanga po. At tayo po magsisimula na. Kunin po natin ang ating mga hymnals sa page 250, page 250, 250. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Page 250, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Ready? Sing, days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near, burdens are lifted at Calvary, 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 burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near cast your care on Jesus today live your worry and fear burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near burdens are lifted at Calvary, 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 burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near on the last, troubled soul the Savior can see, every heartache and tear, burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near Burdens are lifted at Calvary 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 Burdens are lifted 
at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Tayo po yung manalangin. Heavenly Father, maraming pong salamat sa araw na ito. Maraming pong salamat sa mga biyaya na binigyan niyo sa amin sa nagdaang araw at sa lahat ng mga bagay, Panginoon. Uh, pagamat umuulan, masama mo ng panahon, Panginoon, nakarating po kami, iningatan niyo po kami, Panginoon, sa araw nito. Maraming pong salamat uh, sa lahat. Ihanda niyo po ang aming puso isipan sa araw na ito sa mga marilingit namin. At uh, kayo po ang siyang uh, magbigay ng uh, boldness, clarity, and wisdom, Panginoon, sa aming teachers, si Baron Matthew, uh, my page ng uh, na maayos ang, 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 ang inyong salita, Panginoon. Maraming pong salamat sa araw na ito. Kung aming panalangin, in Jesus' name, Amen. Punta po tayo sa page 185. 185, My Savior's Love. 185, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence. Ready, sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how He could love me, a sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, He prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for His own grips, but sweet drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How wonderful, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me on the last. When with the ransom and glory His face I shall see T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me Toro! How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. <clears throat> Alright, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19 in your Bible. Genesis chapter 19, and as our custom is, we'll read the entire chapter of Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. And the Bible reads in Genesis chapter 19, starting at verse number 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early, and go in your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread. And they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come to the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. 
They said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house into them, to them and shut to the door. And they smote them in that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and the two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they, set, when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my lord, behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. O oh, let me escape thither, is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in, and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Benami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here in your house and I ask you right now to just fill me, fill me with your spirit. Please give me boldness and clarity to deliver your message and say the things you would have me to say and help us to be attentive to your word here this evening. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're here in, in Genesis chapter 19. We do have one more sermon uh, next week on Genesis chapter 19. But the name of this sermon is the result of a bad testimony. The result of a bad testimony. Now, that word testimony has a lot of different meanings depending on who you talk to. So I want to just kind of clear things up before we even get into this. Go to John chapter 3 and let me show you this verse. John chapter 3. Because sometimes people will say, well, you know, let's hear your testimony of salvation. And somebody will just kind of stand up and say, well, you know, I used to drink and I don't drink now, right? I, did, I used to not go to church and now I go to church and things like that. But when it comes to receiving a testimony or a testimony in parts of salvation, it has nothing to do with my personal life or what I do. Notice what it says in John 3, verse 33. John 3, verse 33. It says, he that hath received his testimony hath said to his seal that God is true. I mean, the Bible speaks about to be saved, receiving Jesus Christ, as many as received him. And when saying receiving his testimony, saying receiving the testimony of the Lord, meaning, what do you believe about the life of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he, was di he died for us, was buried, and rose again? When you receive that testimony, you receive salvation. It's that simple. And you set to your seal that God is true because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of truth. 
So the moment you get saved, you receive the testimony of the Lord, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of truth, right? So when it comes to a testimony as part of salvation, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? That's all it comes down to. My personal testimony of salvation is I used to believe in a work salvation. Somebody explained the gospel. I believed on Jesus. I called upon him to save me. That's my testimony of salvation, right? But when people talk about testimony, oftentimes they'll talk about how, well, you know, I used to live a bad life and now I live a good life. And look, in terms of living for God, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm preaching about how to have a good testimony tonight and not have a bad testimony. But realize that has nothing to do with salvation. When I'm saying, you know, the result of a bad testimony, it's, it has nothing to do with salvation because Lot's a saved person. He's a saved person who has a bad testimony. And what I mean is people, if they talk about Lot, they wouldn't say he's a Bible reader. They wouldn't say that he's a soul winner. They wouldn't say that he's serving God or anything like that. He had a bad testimony in his life because he wasn't living a godly life. Okay. Now go back to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Don't worry, if I have to turn off the sound, I can just scream. I'm used to it, okay? It'll be all right. Genesis 19. So the result of a bad testimony, point number one, I want to talk about this. The result of a bad testimony means you will have no impact on the society that you live in. No impact whatsoever if you have a bad testimony. Genesis 19, verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now we talked about last week, these are homosexuals, they're sodomites, saying, bring us these men because we want to be physically involved with them. And Lot went out the door onto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you brethren, and pray meaning basically to ask. I'm asking you brethren. He calls them brethren. He calls the homosexuals his brethren. Now, I don't see myself calling Vice Pongi my brother anytime soon, right? He's like, I pray you brethren, do not so wickedly. Right, you know, please don't do this. I mean, these are people that he knew, he communicated with on a regular basis. These are people that he liked, I mean, he got along with. He's like, I'm asking you, please don't do anything bad to them, right? And behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So basically it says, you know what, I'll just give you my daughters if you just need to be physically involved with someone. I'll just throw my, my daughters out to the wolves, so to speak, okay? This is a saved man. This is why we can't look at somebody's personal actions and their works to determine their salvation. There are drunks that we will see in heaven. There are drug addicts that we will see in heaven. There's probably drug dealers we're going to see in heaven. I mean, there's people that live very sinful lives that we are going to see in heaven. There are people that are doing a lot of really bad and wicked things that we're going to see in heaven. Lot is by no means living a good life at all. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. Now, once again, to sojourn means to live temporarily somewhere. And so what these homosexuals are saying is, hey, this guy came in to sojourn. He said he's just staying for six months or a year or two years to just kind of save up money or whatever. He came in for a time period and he will need to be a judge. He thinks he can come to our town and tell us what's right or wrong. Look, all Lot said is, don't molest these men. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's not like he's saying, hey, you know what? I think you should dress differently or anything like that or listen to different types of music. He's saying, hey, don't molest these men. Right? I mean, I think anybody can judge and say, yeah, that's a pretty wicked thing to do. Right? Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So they're going to do worse to Lot. I mean, who knows what they're going to do? Maybe murder him or whatever. Now go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. Now, of course, it's obvious that, you know, Lot is a failure when it comes to living a Christian life. But one thing we need to remember about Sodom and Gomorrah is it, it wasn't 100% filled with homosexuals. I mean, obviously there were a lot and, you know, the Bible speaks about that, but not every single person was. And of course, that's important when we're looking at Matthew chapter 11, because this, this is the main verse used to teach a false doctrine. And I'll show it to you here. Matthew 11, verses 23 and 24. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. 
For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And so people turn to this passage and they say, no, wait a minute. If all these good works and mighty works were done in Sodom, it would have never been destroyed. And of course, that is what the Bible says. And they use that passage and they say, well, see, that proves homosexuals can get saved, right? They use this to try to prove that. No, hold on a second. A couple of things to consider. Number one, it's talking about a country at large. It's not talking about an individual situation. God himself said, if there's 10 saved people, I'm not going to destroy Sodom. Right? So, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it wouldn't matter if it was 90% homos. I mean, if there was 10 saved people, he wasn't destroying the city. Right? And I do believe that God had already made a decision. It's so wicked, I'm going to destroy it. But I'm just saying he had agreed with Abraham. So here's the thing. Even if there was a major sin, if there was enough saved people, God said, I'm not going to destroy it. Even though there's this major sin. Okay? This is speaking to a country at large. And here's the thing. If these mighty works were done, there would have been people getting saved. Not everybody was a reprobate. There are people that were able to get saved. Look, Lot was living in that town. He could have gotten some people saved. It wouldn't have been a big deal to have 10 people saved. We don't know how long he lived there, but I mean, it was for a long enough period of time that he's respected in town. I mean, if he gets one person saved every six months, you're probably going to get up to 10 pretty quickly, right? And so this passage is used, but this is not about an individual person. It's about a country overall. I mean, Nineveh was a wicked country, but when they turned to God, or at least some of the people did, I mean, what happens? God didn't destroy it. Okay. Now go back to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Genesis 18. The other thing is this. Genesis 19 is the end of how wicked they got. Well, what about 100 years before that? Right? Because when you look at countries, I mean, look at our country. I mean, 100 years ago, it's not like there were a lot of homos 100 years ago. So this statement from Matthew 11, it doesn't say, well, in the time of Lot at that exact moment. Right? I mean, it could have been before that. We're basically saying, hey, here's a society that became very wicked, filled full of sin. However, if the gospel had been really preached in that area, it would have never gotten to that point. Right? That's the way, you know, when I read it, I'm looking at Matthew chapter 11. We're not looking at an individual case. You certainly can't pull those verses out and say, well, thus saith the Lord, because it's a country at whole. It doesn't tell you the time frame. And what the Bible indicates is that even in that wicked area, some people would have gotten saved. Right? And there are just parts of this world that are more receptive than other parts. Look, if you look historically at various countries of this world, in some countries, the gospel just never caught on. Never caught on. Never caught on in Japan. I mean, part of it's because the country banned Christianity from Japan for quite a while, but there's just certain countries that it never caught on. I mean, traditionally, Asian countries, not really the Philippines, but other Asian countries, Christianity never really caught on in a lot of Asian countries. It never caught on in these Buddhist countries and these Hindu countries. I mean, it just didn't catch on like it did to other parts of the world. Right? There are just certain parts of the world because of the culture, because of the beliefs, the false religions, or whatever the case, or the sin. For whatever reason, it doesn't catch on as much. However, the Bible is saying Sodom was an area that people would have actually gotten saved if these mighty works were done. And Jesus is using that to say, hey, here is a very wicked area. However, you're worse because you had opportunities to hear the gospel. You had opportunities for the truth, and you rejected it. Right? Now, a couple of things to keep in mind, and I'm not preaching a whole sermon on the reprobate doctrine, but when I'm preaching a sermon like this, it's important to kind of lay the foundation. When you read throughout the Bible and you're looking at people that are children of the devil or reprobates, the vast majority are not homosexuals. There's no indication that Balaam was a homosexual. There's no indication that Cain was a homosexual. And Balaam represents the false prophet that's after covetousness, like all about money. And what you need to realize is that just because somebody's a reprobate, that doesn't mean that they're a homo. Okay. People try to make them the exact same. And then you'll show somebody doing all of these wicked works. They did this and this and this. Well, they can't be a reprobate because, you know, they're not a homo. Well, that's not the same thing, though. Right. There are people that choose to reject God because of their hatred for the violence that was done to them as a child 
and then they go down that same road oftentimes of being a homo but there's other people that just grow up in a false religion like islam or mormonism and they just decide i believe this with all my heart i reject what the bible says and they become a reprobate by a different means it's very likely they're never going to go down that road of that sort of sexual perversion right and so i want you to realize this that in 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 the book of genesis 19 it's a unique case because it is a society filled with this specific sin it's obviously become an infestation but not every reprobate in the bible is a homo okay and sometimes people get confused on that because we preach so hard against the vice pongits that people think that we're saying they're one and the same but that's actually not what i'm saying what the bible says is that a person when they reject god however the method is that they reject god whatever hatred they have serial killer like ted bundy only attacked women only attacked women obviously something was done to him as a kid because of women which what i've heard is his mom said that she was his sister and then he was very angry towards women about that but basically that shows he had hatred toward that group of people because of things that happened and then that's kind of the direction he went down but no matter what way you become a reprobate or why you reject god or what happened to influence that decision once you do that your conscience is seared now depending on what road you went down you're probably not going to get into various things that others might get into but your mind is completely seared your conscience is seared you have no guilt about doing wrong and you're fully just you know whatever it is that you're into just fully going to go down the road if it's a false prophet you're going to fight to the bitter end with your doctrine or whatever that is but in genesis chapter 19 as i said it's a unique case okay now go to genesis 18 actually genesis 18 genesis 18 but here's what we do teach though if somebody starts just basically diving into unnatural sins and that is the lust of their heart and that's what their desire and you know what the easy way to look at it is with sexual perversion simply because you know what that's something especially in our society today you see this all the time and everything but look it would be an unnatural desire for someone to want to kill people like serial killers right that's a weird thing to take enjoyment to torture other people and things like that that shows that their mind and conscience is just seared okay what we do teach though is that if someone just is a full-blown homosexual they said you know i'm a homo i'm not saying somebody who got molested as a kid and got confused for a little while or whatever obviously there can be some gray area situations but if someone says you know what i am a homo i lust after people of the same gender i'm not interested in those of the other gender and everything what we teach is that shows an unnatural desire which shows it's a byproduct a cause and effect that they've been rejected by god they have that unnatural desire what you're seeing in genesis 19 is people that have that unnatural desire what we're not saying though is that every single person that's a reprobate is a homo and what we're also not saying is that the blood of jesus doesn't cover that sin because the bible says he died for the sins of the whole world jesus died for every single sin in the world and paid for every single sin what we're saying though is those people have already been rejected they're never going to change their mind to believe on jesus to get saved you must change your mind and believe on jesus but when your conscience is seared you're never going to feel guilty and if you never feel guilty you're never going to say that you need a savior right and so once somebody's conscience is seared they can never get saved there's no return that's the way it is okay in genesis 19 a large group of this society had already gone down that direction and you can see it with this desire to just harm these innocent men that have done nothing to them genesis 18 verse 32 <clears throat> genesis 18 verse 32 and i know we read this before let's just be reminded genesis 18 verse 32 and he said oh let not the lord be angry and i will speak yet but this once peradventure ten shall be found there and he said i will not destroy for ten sakes so there's god saying to abraham if ten saved people are in all of sodom i'm not going to destroy it that's a really low number we have more than ten people saved in this room right i mean ten's a really really low number of requirement for people to be saved and the lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with abraham and abraham returned onto his place now 
Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9 in your New Testament. So how is it that there were not 10 saved people? Well, because Abraham, or I mean not Abraham, but Lot, had no impact on his society that he lived in. See, <clears throat> there's this idea from people that if you want to reach really sinful people, you got to kind of meet them halfway. Right? You can't criticize them for their beliefs. You can't say anything bad. If you want to reach the world, you got to be like the world. Right? You want to reach, you want to reach people that listen to rock music? You better listen to Christian rock. I mean, meet them halfway. Isn't that what they say? I mean, a church like ours could never survive in 2022. That's what they say. This sort of preaching, I mean, you're never going to reach the next generation. You're never going to reach the people that are young. This sort of preaching just doesn't work in 2022 because society is too far gone. I would say the opposite. I would say there's a lot of people that look at this world and in the same lame preaching from every church, and they're like, this is nothing. This doesn't make sense. And then they hear this kind of preaching. It's like, man, this sounds like the truth. This seems right. Now, look, this kind of preaching, when you first hear it, there might be a few things where it's like, man, I don't know about that. That seems a little bit overboard. Seems a little bit extreme. But then you hear it, you're like, well, this is certainly makes a lot more sense than what I'm hearing in the world. And then you start hearing it, you realize this is actually not strange at all. And you start reading the Bible and your eyes are just opened up. Like you've, I mean, you've read the Bible, but then all of a sudden you start hearing this preaching and it's like the veil comes off your eyes and you realize, man, I mean, this is what Christianity is. This is what the Old Testament was believing in the true God. This kind of preaching. This is why they tried to kill all the prophets. The message they preach, they preach hard against sin. It's like, man, this makes sense. If you want to reach the world, you don't have to be like the world. Be different than the world. In fact, what we see is that Lot is just like the world. He doesn't reach the world. Genesis, or not Genesis, but 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for, for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, people will look at this passage and they'll say, well, see, Paul said I became a Jew to the Jews. Therefore, I want to get my friends saved. They go out and drink. I'm just going to go to the bar with them because I got to be like them to reach them. Where in this passage does Paul ever say to the sinner, I just started sinning to the drunk? I became as a drunk. When he's saying to the Jew, I became, he's just saying he tried to fit in with the culture that he lived in. He didn't try to stand out and be strange. He tried to fit in. It's not justifying or advocating living a sinful life. And like, how far are you going to take that sort of belief? Because people say, well, I'll go to a bar and just hang out with people getting drunk. I just won't drink because I want to reach them. How are you going to reach them when they're drunk? How are you going to preach the gospel to your friend at the bar when he's drunk? I mean, when I go soul winning and I run into someone who's drunk, I just politely say, hey, you know, we'd love to have you come to church because they're not going to get saved if they're drunk. I mean, this happened to me just on Sunday when I was going soul winning. And, you know, sometimes you're going soul winning and we went to, what is it, Iskanita? Is that what you call it? And Iskanita. So it's like, it's super magulo. We had a bunch of people and we're all splitting up and, and talking to people. And then I ran into this guy that was just a little bit too friendly in the street. And he's like, yeah, come, you know talk to me my friends we work at call center and he asked me over over and over again are you an american or are you british and i told him many times american but it he didn't remember right and so then all of a sudden he's like oh come talk to my friends so then i was like well i don't know if this is a good idea so i'm kind of going out side the east Canita to go up to the house and then all of a sudden there's three of them there and then you know i can see like red horse and like they're drinking and everything and i just said la sing bakayo and they're like, he's like, oh, I was like, all right, well, <laughs> have a nice day. You say, why? I'm not going to reach the drunk when he's drunk. Now, if I'm going to try to reach that guy when he's not drunk. If he wasn't drunk, I'd try to preach the gospel. And in fact, with that guy, I knew there was something wrong with him. I mean, actually, I thought he was crazy. It turns out he was just drunk, I guess. But, you know, if his friends hadn't been drunk, I'd try to preach the gospel because there'd be somebody who was sober. 
But what I'm saying is, how are you going to reach people that are doing that while they're doing it? Instead, act different and your light can actually shine. So, you know, they'll at least be like, why don't you do this? Now, I'm not saying they're going to come towards you and just say, okay, well, I want to quit drinking too. What I'm saying is they'll realize that you're different. But if you're acting just like them and then you try to bring up the Bible, why would I listen to you when you do the same thing as me? Right? Whereas if you actually stand out and you're different, then they might actually listen to you because they might actually respect you and say, well, hey, you know, you actually follow what you, you know, you practice what you preach. It's different. You know, I remember, you know, when I was newly saved and I'd hear a lot of people say this and there's truth to it. And obviously real Bible Christianity is different than what people think it is, you know, but they'd say, well, you know what? You Christians do the exact same things that we do. People that were in college that were getting drunk and doing all this stuff. Anyway, a lot, a lot of that was true. I was in these Christian groups when I first got saved and many of them are going out and doing the same things that everybody else is doing. Right? And unfortunately, that gives a bad light to all of us, even when they're not Christian at all and they have nothing to do with us. Right? But what I'm saying is this. If you want to reach the world, actually just stand up for what God says. We reach them as we go soul winning. And the people in your personal life, even if they disagree with you and whatever and they don't want to listen to you, here's what's going to happen. When they fall on rough times because the alcohol destroys their life, you might actually be the person that they turn to. Because they're thinking, man, maybe I've been lied to about all this. Maybe what I'm doing is wrong. They might actually listen to you. But you know what? If you're just a drunk like them, they're not going to listen to you. Look, personal experience proves everything I'm saying, but the Bible does too. Because they reach these people, they reach groups of people, not by living the same sinful life as them, but by actually being different. I'm pretty sure the 12 apostles lived pretty separated lives and reached a lot of people. I'm pretty sure Lot didn't live a separated life at all and reached nobody. Go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Genesis 18. I mean, if Abraham had gotten to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what? Sodom probably would have lasted. You say, why? He probably would have gotten some people saved. I mean, if mighty works were done there, if Abraham had gone in and just started setting up a soul winning plan, I'm going to go every single week and just started getting people saved. You know what? I think that it would have lasted. I think there are people ready to get saved. And look, when you live in a society that is, is really sinful like that, a lot of people look, and there's a lot of people I'm sure that lived in Sodom and thought, you know what, there's something wrong with this. Because people in today's world, there's plenty of people here in the Philippines that look at what's going on and they're, we're, we're like, what is, is, is wrong with the world? Unsaved people feel that way, right? It's not just us that are Bible-believing Christians. Many just normal people look at the things going on they think it's disgusting and filthy hey it's not like i what it was when i was a kid that's what a lot of people think genesis 18 18 verse 20 genesis 18 verse 20 and this is what the lord said and the lord said because the cry of sodom and gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous i will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which has come unto me and if not i will know now look when abraham's hearing this I kind of wonder if Abraham surprised himself because it's like, is it really that bad? Because, I mean, obviously he knows his nephew's there. I don't know that Abraham and Lot were really staying in communication with each other. I, I think it's kind of hard to tell. Obviously, there's no cell phones, internet, things like that. What I'm saying is this, like, I think Abraham was kind of surprised, like, it's, it's being destroyed. Because his reaction is just like, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? You shouldn't do that, God. It's too harsh. But he doesn't realize how bad it actually is. Now, turn to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And I saw for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Look, this is a sad verse in the Bible where God states he's looking for a person to just stand up for the truth, preach the truth, do the right thing, and I couldn't find anybody. And if God spoke about Genesis 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah, he'd say, you know what? I'm looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. I got a man who saved over here a lot, 
But I can't find a single person to stand in the hedge and make up the gap and do what's right. None, right? Look, people move and live in different areas all around the world. Wherever you live, you should decide, you know what, I want to have an impact on that society. I'm going to be the person, the man or the woman who just stands up and does right. If nobody else is doing the truth, I'm going to. If nobody else is going soul winning, I'm going to go soul winning. If the whole world becomes sinful and is worldly, I am not going to because I'm going to stand in the gap. But that was not Lot. He's a man who lived just like the world and he had no impact, no impact on Sodom and Gomorrah, none whatsoever. Go to John 4. John 4. John 4. John chapter 4 is a famous story where basically Jesus gets this woman saved who had lived a pretty bad life and she had done a lot of wrong things. And basically, you know, she, she's, you know, shocked when he knows all this information. But notice what it says in John 4 verse 28. John 4 verse 28. The woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I mean, she gets saved and then she just goes up to people and says, Hey, you know what? He told me everything I ever did. Now, people knew who this woman was. She was kind of known in society. But he's saying, you know what? He realized that I was guilty and I did all of these things. Listen to this man. This is the Christ, right? And she's just saying, hey, I just got saved. And then she's trying to reach her society. Go to verse 39. Verse 39. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman was testified. He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come on to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there for two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ the savior of the world. Say, so what's the difference between this woman and Lot? Here's the difference. They knew for a long time what Lot believed or the God that he believed in. And they knew Lot to be a man who believed in his God, but didn't really follow anything that God said. This woman, on the other hand, she's done a lot of bad things, but then all of a sudden she gets saved. And it's, it's, it's kind of a surprise to them because, whoa, we've never heard her talk like this before. Completely different. Lot, on the other hand, they know who he believes in, which God he believes in. They know where he came from, his ethnicity and things like that. So I'm sure they knew that he believes in the Hebrew God and everything. But here's Lot, who's just living a sinful life, and then they don't want to hear anything from him. And here's the thing, you know, what Christians do when they're too afraid to just stand up and do what's right, they'll still say, well, you know, I'm a Baptist if people ask them. But they just kind of do it in a shy way and everything. Well, a couple years later, when you've been working there for two years as a Baptist and never doing anything different, laughing at the same dirty jokes everyone else does, saying nothing when people use the Lord's name in vain and everything, they're going to think that you don't really take your Christianity that seriously. Because for two years they've been around you and you haven't taken it seriously. So why would they expect? And then if you start taking it seriously now, it's just like, you know, come on. Right? You've been a Christian for years and you're living just like us. You know, I'm not going to listen to you. Now, what's different is this woman, she just gets saved and she's excited and, and they're like, whoa, right? Now, turn in your Bible to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Why couldn't Lot reach the society? Well, I mean, he's sitting in the gate of Sodom. I mean, he's obviously, you know, mingled with the people. I mean, he, he's willing to pass over their sin. I mean, he offers his daughters to them. That's the sort of testimony that Lot has. Now, of course, this is the worst that we see of Lot. What I'm saying is his whole life, when he's living in Sodom and Gomorrah, he's not doing anything right. So why would they listen to him about the Bible? Now, of course, the homos aren't going to listen to him anyway. But I'm saying the rest of the society. Because there's plenty of people in Sodom that he could have reached with the gospel, but he didn't. You say, why? Because he, like everybody else, just approved of the sin that was there, said nothing about it, and so nobody wanted to listen to him. Right? No impact on the society. Point number one, Lot had no impact on his society. And the second point, actually our final point is this, he had no impact on his family and the people that were close to him. Not only did he not reach society, he didn't reach his actual family that was close to him. And you know this is important because people have this sort of idea, well, I want to reach my Catholic relatives, so I'm going to go to the graves on All Saints Day. 
and just basically approve of this pagan thing that they're doing, which is wrong. Because I want to reach my Catholic relatives. Well, I mean, does Lot do a good job reaching his family with this sort of technique of approving of the things that they're doing that are wrong? Look at what it says in Genesis 19, verse 3. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in onto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now, the first thing I've mentioned before, the first thing we see in Genesis 19, is that Lot's wife is just pretty much gone from the picture. This is not a very functional family. I mean, late at night, she's not around and everything, and it's just like, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it just kind of shows that their, their marriage and everything is just a mess. Look, if you're living in Sodom and Gomorrah and living like Sodom and Gomorrah and living in sin, you're not going to have a good marriage. You're not going to have a good family. Everything's going to be a failure, right? And we see this as we develop this chapter and as I preach. Lot's wife has no respect for him at all. None whatsoever, right? Verse 8. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Well, I mean, it's pretty hard for a wife to respect her husband when he offers their daughters to these, you know, rabid homos that want to molest, right? I mean, just, just, just think, you know, if you're a wife and your husband just allowed your kids to just whatever happened, I mean, you wouldn't have any respect for them. Now, of course, this is an extreme example, but I'm sure that Lot's done many things that are not exactly godly if he goes to this extreme. Because I read this in Genesis 19, verse 8, and it shocks me every time I read it. How could a father offer his daughters? Right? I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I could see Lot offering himself, but I can't imagine a parent offering their kids. You say, why would Lot? I mean, obviously, Lot is just a very selfish person at this point in his life. He only cares about himself. He wanted to go to Sodom and Gomorrah because it was beautiful, lots of money and everything. No love, no care at all for his family. I mean, just offers his daughters. Of course your wife's not going to respect you if that's the sort of person you are. I mean, if that's the sort of leader you are for your home, why would your wife respect you? Right? I promise you, there's no wives in this room that are going to respect their husbands if they're going to do something so wicked and so vile. So, of course, his wife doesn't respect him. Now, this is not to say that Lot's wife's a great person because we see what happens to her in this chapter. I'm just saying... Well, you're going to be the leader in your home lot and you're doing this. No impact on his family. Why? Because of the way you're living. You can't get your wife to follow you because of the way you live. You're living a sinful life. Verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So Lot is basically told, Hey, it's going to be destroyed. You just do everything you can this night. Get as many people saved as you can. Get them to come with you. Get them to leave the city with you. Right? Basically, this he's being told, hey, you know what? You got less than 24 hours. You better get the job done. I mean, imagine if, if God told you that this place will be, be destroyed in 12 hours. Basically, when you wake up the next day, you got to go. Right? Now, obviously, it's already nighttime now. But I'm saying, let's say you get this message during the day. You're going to do everything you can to get your family to come and just frantically try to tell them, hey, you must believe this. You know, this is what God said. Well, that's what Lot does. He's desperate. Verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. Now, let me just say this. I do, I do not believe these daughters are the same daughters as were earlier in the chapter because the daughters earlier, he said, have not known a man. Whether he actually believes they're virgins or not, because I don't believe they're virgins based on what they do at the end of Genesis 19, personally. But here's the thing. I mean, he wouldn't say, hey, they've not known a man if they're married, because they'd say, what are you talking about? They're married, right? These are different daughters. So Lot has at least four daughters, perhaps more. There were specifically two daughters later in Genesis 19. But here what it talks about is his sons-in-law. So at least two sons-in-law, at least two daughters, outside of the other two. So at least four daughters overall. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. So he says, We need to go. God's going to destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. I mean, his sons are all like, Yeah, I know you believe in that religion thing, but you do the same thing we do. You drink just like we do. 
And now you're going to talk about the Lord? I mean, come on. We know you're not real spiritual. Why are you pretending to be spiritual? Why are we going to trust what you say? Of course he has no impact on his family because he's living just like them. I mean, he's, he gets drunk just like they get drunk. He's worldly just like they're worldly. He approves of sin, so I mean, why would they listen to him? They don't listen to him. And they think like he's making a big joke. They don't take him seriously. It's like, ha ha, that's funny. Law. I mean, they literally think he's just telling them a joke. It's like a, just like an April Fool's joke or something like that. He seemed as one that mocked. It's like, come on. <laughs> you expect us to believe that? We know that you don't really believe in this. We know that you're not like your uncle Abraham. Come on, Lot. We know who you are. We've been around you. It's just like, you know what? We've been around you for years. You've never been spiritual before. And it's just like, you know what? Why would I trust your opinion on spiritual things when you're not spiritual yourself? And look, it's just common sense. If you're not spiritual, why would people want to listen to you about spiritual things? Right? Verse number 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife. Now, hasten means to basically try to hurry up Lot. They're like, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Look, if I was told that, you know what, this place is being destroyed the next day, I would leave bright and early. Right? Wake up early and get out of there. But Lot's just kind of lingering. His family's just kind of lingering. And while he lingered, <clears throat> the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. <clears throat> so basically, the angels just take him and get him to leave because otherwise he's just hanging there. It's being destroyed. And then it says, the Lord being merciful unto him. Now, why are they merciful unto him? Well, because of Abraham. We saw that before. We see that later on in this chapter. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Without the city means away from the city as it's going to be destroyed. Basically, far away from the destruction that's going to take place. Okay, he's outside the city now. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. I mean, God specifically told you, and these angels specifically tell you what to do, and now you're trying to say no. Right? I don't want to go to that mountain. It's like, who are you to try to talk to God and try to change his mind? I mean, the Bible says, you know, none can stay his hand. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says in, in, in Daniel chapter 4. It's like God's already determined this is taking place. And then you're saying, well, you know, we don't want to go to that mountain. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, see, I've accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city for the which thou hast spoken. Anyway, God, God allows him to do this. But we see just a few verses later, Lot has to flee that area. Because it's not actually a good area. Right? I mean, God, God allows them to do this. But honestly, you know what? When you're living a sinful life, sometimes God just gives you what you want. That's the truth. If you're living a sinful life, sometimes God just gives you what you deserve. Well, I'm not going to go to that city. I'm not going to do what you said, God. It's too far. I can't listen to your instruction. Well, then just do whatever you want then. So, all right, I've accepted thee. Just do what you want. We'll see what happens. Right? I mean... Sometimes God gives you what you deserve. Now, here's the thing. When you're serving God and doing right, God helps you not make mistakes if you make bad choices. Right? If you're not sure what direction to go in life, I believe God's going to guide you and lead you on that path. But with people like Lot, it's just like, okay, you want to make a bad decision? Go for it. It's not like you ever listened to me or cared about what I said anyway. I mean, I'm just fulfilling what Abraham wanted. You're not going to be killed. Okay? But I'll just give you what you want and it's not going to be good for you. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. He's saying, I can't do anything. I can't fully destroy this because you need to just get out of here. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, on a side point, verse 24 actually gives us a peek at the Trinity because the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord. So the Lord reigns from the Lord, indicating, of course, there's three persons in the Godhead. 
And so the person who actually makes this actual destruction, you know, I guess could be the, the son of God or whatever, but basically the Lord reigns from the Lord, right? So you see many times in Genesis where we'll mention, you know, basically multiple persons in the Godhead. So that's kind of a side point. You can look at that in your free time. But verse 25, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Maybe if he had just done what God said and just gotten way away from the area that's being destroyed, your wife wouldn't have looked back. But when you're staying close to Sodom, your heart can kind of just kind of look, say, well, you know, and then she gets destroyed. Why didn't you just do what God said? Right? Now, what I believe about her becoming a pillar of salt, and I'm not going to go there for sake of time, I have before, is and talked about it, is the fact that we are the salt of the earth. I mean, there's a reason why she became a pillar of salt. She doesn't become a pillar of, you know, pepper or toyo or whatever, <laughs> right? She becomes a pillar of salt, and it's because we are the salt of the earth. And it's kind of like a reminder, hey, Lot, your job was to preserve, because salt is a preservative. It's used to preserve food. When they'd go on ships, they'd put salt on meat, and it would last for a very long time. We preserve the earth based on how we live our lives. And if there was 10 people saved in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have been preserved. So it's kind of like a reminder there about, hey, you know what? We're supposed to preserve the earth, right? And his wife becomes a pillar of salt. This is how she dies. She looks back behind him. And look, we need to be reminded of Lot's wife because the New Testament even says, remember Lot's wife. It's something that's important to God that we remember. And the analogy we can have is this, that you can't go back and look at your life of worldliness and sin and just say, well, you know, my, my heart is kind of this direction to serve God and it's kind of this direction, you know, of the sins of my past or whatever. You got to just decide to flee your sin and go without the city as God said, right? You can't just look back and look, we've all made mistakes. We've all done things that are wrong. We've all had things in the past that took our attention away from the right things. We can't just focus on those things in life. We need to move on, go without the city. Verse 27, and Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of that country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. The only reason why Lot is spared and the only reason why God allows Lot to be obnoxious, just complaining the whole time, is because he cares about Abraham. And Abraham basically spares Lot because Abraham is godly. Now, look, it's interesting to me that Abraham cares more about the society being saved than Lot does. Abraham doesn't even live there. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I've seen this, you know, when you're at a church like ours, we do a lot of soul winning and everything. And we have a desire to get churches started, you know, all over Luzon, right? To get send people out, to start churches and everything. And, you know, what's interesting is, Sometimes people like us, we have more of a burden for those areas than people that are saved that live in those areas. I mean, I've always told people this. If you want to get a like-minded church started in your area, step number one, have a group of people that just go soul winning every week together. Step number one. Because here's the thing. If there's a need, God's going to fill it. We started a church recently in Beekle, and we started it because there was a need. I mean, we, we just kind of sponsored a few soul winning events. We just kind of paid for their lunch and everything like that. But a lot of people going soul winning and then just faithfully all the time going soul winning. It's like, well, there's a need. It's just like, all right, we'll start the church. It's not like I had this personal desire. I just can't wait to get a church started in Beekle. I don't, I've never been to Beekle. I'd like to visit. I've heard it's nice and everything, but I've never been. Starting a new church just means more work. I mean, it's not like it makes life easy or anything like that. But why do we do it? There's a need. Why do we start the church here? There is a need. There are families ready for it. That's the template for how we're going to start other churches in the future. Hey, if there's a group of people, if there's families and people ready, then hey, that could be an area to start a church. But sometimes people that don't live in the areas care more about it than people that do live in the areas. I mean, it's amazing to me, whenever new churches like ours get started, you know, there's, there's all these like-minded new IFB people, and then many times the church gets started in the area, and these people that have been praying for a church that's like-minded, they listen to all the sermons online, the church gets started, they stop coming after a month. 
It's like you've been listening online for years. And then the church gets started, and then they just, because they're not actually looking for a church. It's a lot easier just to look online at YouTube. Right? I mean, this always happens. Every single church. You know, we started our church, and you know what? We, our first day, our first service, we had 40 people, which it was a bit of an artificial high because of the fact there was people that were just visiting from out of the country that wanted to support the first day and everything. But we would have like in the high 20s for our services around 30 or low 30, somewhere around there for the first, you know, several months of our church and everything like that. And it's just like, but you know, here's the thing. There's some people that were just really excited for the church and then they're just kind of gone after a couple weeks and everything. Right? I mean, I can think of many families, you know, where it's just like, man, because I was thinking in my head kind of naively, like, man, we're going to have a really strong attendance. And then all of a sudden, it's just all these people just, psh. it's like you've been listening online for years and praying for this church and then it starts and then you just give up on it after a couple weeks. Doesn't make sense to me. But what I've found is that oftentimes people are more excited for the church and the great work to be done that don't live in the area. And the people that are saved that live in the area, they don't care that much, right? That's what we see with Abraham and Lot. Verse 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in the cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Now, Here's the thing, according to his, his daughters, they, they believe that the whole world's been destroyed. Because they say there's not a man in the earth. I mean, Lot, you didn't even tell your family what was going on? You're just running, you didn't stop to tell them, hey, you know what? God's going to destroy this area because this area is really wicked. But actually around the world, it's not filled with all these homeless. It's just here in Sodom and Gomorrah. He doesn't even stop to tell his daughters. No wonder you have no impact on your daughters. No wonder everything else happens in Genesis 19. You didn't even stop to tell them what was going on. They have no idea. Right? I mean, his, his daughters have no idea. They say there's not a man in the earth. I mean, God was very clear. He's just destroying this area. But they have no idea. They think the world's been destroyed. They think it's like, you know, Noah's Ark Part 2. Like, we're the most righteous people in the world. I mean, that's what they think. It's like, man... Do you ever even have a conversation with your daughters? You haven't even told them what's going on? Or you just, you just offer your daughters, you know, to the wolves, right? It's like, it's, it's crazy. He didn't even tell them. They say there's not a man in the earth. Verse 32, we'll end at this verse. I wanted to show you one other thing. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Well, let me ask you a question. Where did he get the wine from? Did he stop at a 7-Eleven? Did he stop at a grocery store? I don't think there's any grocery stores along the way. I mean, a couple of possibilities. One, you either brought wine with you or you quickly made it. Probably you just brought it with you. Boy, talk about holding on to your sin. What a shock he has no impact on society or his family. It's just, you don't even tell your daughters what's going on. I don't think his wife fully knew what was going on. And it's just like your sons-in-law laugh at you because they know the sort of person that you are. And then he brings wine with him, which next week we'll talk about the dangers of alcohol. We'll see everything that takes place. But just realize, I mean, wine doesn't appear out of thin air. He obviously brought it with him or, or, or made it. And I don't think he had enough time to make it, so he probably brought it with him. And it's just like, wow, you never even, I mean, you would think if God says, hey, you know what, this area is so wicked, I'm going to destroy it, that, you know what, he would have made sure not to bring any alcohol. Or... If it's his daughters that brought the alcohol or whatever, it's like, well, shame on you for being a bad father and having no impact on your daughters. Shame on you for not making sure that, you know, it's a, pro I mean, this, this is just a crazy story. And you know what? Here's the thing. This is not the most pleasant story to read. When we get to Genesis 19 in our Bible reading, it's, it's, it's an entertaining story. I mean, a lot of big events are taking place, but... It, you, you, I try to, to put myself in the place of these situations because, you know, when you read the Bible, sometimes you kind of read over it and you miss a lot of stuff. I try to just kind of stop and kind of put myself in the place of Lot or Abraham to see, you know, how they were feeling and what's going on. This is not the most pleasant one. It's like, man, what a messed up chapter. Everything that goes on in this chapter. But what we're seeing is that Lot was a man... But a terrible testimony. 
He was known as a person who didn't really care about spiritual things, didn't care about the things of God. And then when finally, out of desperation, he decides to try to get right with God or try to save people from the area, he doesn't go the whole way. They bring wine with him. He doesn't even tell his, his kids what are going on. His whole life's messed up. And we see he has no impact on society, no impact on his family. And you know, this is where you get the Moabites and the Ammonites from because of his daughters and the kids that he has with them, which we're going to see next week is very disturbing. That's where they come from. These wicked and heathen nations come as a result of what his daughters do to him. And we'll talk about that next week. But look, you know, it, as a reminder, just to all of us, we need to make sure we have a good testimony. You want to reach your unsafe family and look, all of us have unsafe family that we want to reach probably. If you want to reach your unsafe family, you need to have the best testimony you possibly can. Meaning, you know what? You need to be above reproach. You can't just give them things where they can criticize you. They need to be able to look at your life. And even if they disagree, say, you know what? They take that very seriously. They're doing a good job as a family. They're conservative. They're obeying God's rules. And it's going to give you more of an opportunity to reach them with the gospel. But if you act just like them, and do everything they do and just say, well, you know what? On All Saints Day, we'll just go out to the graves just because you know, that's just, you know, we want to get along with them. And you just approve of everything they do wrong. Now, look, I'm not telling you to, to I'm not saying that you, you should tell them that what they're doing is super sinful or whatever. I think you ought to be, try to be as respectful as possible. For example, in that sort of situation, I'd say, you know, I'm sorry, that's, you know, not something we can do or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's against our beliefs, but not be super rude to them. Although sometimes they might take offense because... It is what it is when you take a stand. But what I'm saying is, if you want to reach your family, you want to reach your friends, you want to reach people around here, you want to reach your acquaintances, you want to reach your boss, your coworkers, and things like that, you need to have a good testimony. When we go soul winning door to door, they don't know how sinful our lives are or not sinful. They don't know who we are. So if they're interested in the gospel, they'll listen. But here's the thing, your family does know to some degree. Your coworkers do know to some degree. And if you want to reach them, don't act like them. Be different than them. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today and I ask you to help us to apply this to our lives. Help us not to be like Lot, God. Help us to have good testimonies. Help us to strive to just obey your rules and do right and just always try to strive to reach higher and better each and every passing day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Puli po natin ang ating mga hymnals sa page 208. 208. 208. Grace greater than our soul. 208. Grace greater than our soul. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Mold to the fringe, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. 
What can avail to wash it away? Let this flowing a crimson tide Whiter than snow you may be today Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is given and cleansed within Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is greater than all our sin Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You that are longing to see His face Mint His grace receive Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon all our sins day you're cleaning the church but if you can try to test all this and see I just turned it off during the service